everybody, and welcome to the Monday morning introduction to philosophy and theory class. My name is Julian. And I'm Jeneline. Jeneline being here to my Good left. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> it is a chilly morning here in Washington. And if you're joining us for the very first time today, welcome. Mm -hmm. We're so glad that you're here. This is a weekly open access introduction to philosophy and theory class that I've been teaching for the past two years. If you're joining us for the very first time, fret not. You don't need to have any previous experience. You can join us right here, right now. We try to design all these classes for beginners so that you can simply get started with us. Um, there's a couple announcements that I have to make this morning. I should be doing a drum roll for this. One of them is that today is the final day that you can download my ebook, The Hermeneutic Temptation, which is an introduction to Zizek, Lacan, Hegel, and Marx. It is a 100-page book that should hopefully be easy to read. And um, many of you have already read it. Many of you have already downloaded. So thank you to those of you who have purchased my book. Mm -hmm. That's actually what finances <laughs> this project and helps keep these classes open access. Um, but that book's going to be available for one more day, today being January 31st. And starting tomorrow, the book will no longer be available. Now, why will it no longer be available? That's because tomorrow... Well, actually not tomorrow, today. <laughs> today I'm going to be posting my new book, the sequel, volume two, which is called The Vanishing Mediator. If you followed the previous lecture series, you'll know that The Vanishing Mediator is the title of the previous 12 week series that I just taught. And I've turned that entire series, that 12 week series into a short book. It's 85 pages and it's subtitled From Kant to Hegel. So if you're looking for an introduction for the transition from Kantian transcendental idealism towards Hegelian speculative idealism, and if you're curious how Zizek frames that transition through Lacanian psychoanalysis, you can find all of that and more in my new book called The Vanishing Mediator. Now, if you decide to become a patron today, if you decide to download the first book, The Hermeneutic Temptation, uh, not only will you be getting that book at the very last moment before it disappears forever into the digital ether. But you will also get two books essentially for the price of one. You'll be able to get the new book, The Vanishing Mediator and The Hermeneutic Temptation both today on Patreon. So that's my little announcement. Um, <laughs> this is also your reminder if you're planning on canceling your Patreon at the end of the month. <laughs> wow. To <laughs> Thank make you sure that. to download the next book. Thank you I'm for that. I'm here for the people. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And Jenlene is saying that if you'd like to cancel your Patreon membership, here's a reminder. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> I'm just saying. All of our hard won patrons. <laughs> um, but I mean, on a, on, a, on a slightly more serious note, Thank you to all of our patrons for supporting this project. Um, it's really just an enormous privilege that we get to do this, mm -hmm. that we get to be mobile and travel. Uh, right now, we've been traveling around the U.S., but pretty soon we're going to be traveling around the world. We're going to go to Europe. And who knows? Maybe we'll even travel <laughs> beyond that. So it's just an enormous privilege to be able to work with such freedom and most of all, to be able to work with such a loving and supportive community like yourselves, which is just absolutely, absolutely incredible. Yeah, it means a lot to us. And I already see some of you commenting on what country you're joining us from. Keep oh, yeah. it coming because we love knowing where you're um, watching from and joining us and feeling like we are all part of this learning community. It means yeah. a lot to us. Please do leave a comment telling us where you're joining us from. That always makes us very, very happy. Um, one of the best things about doing this is that it really is so international. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Um, I'll just go ahead and say that I'm going to be a little bit more, a little bit more unhinged than usual today because I've been working on the second book, which I have finished and I've been up until <laughs> two in the morning for the past week going on very little sleep, but the vanishing mediator from Kant to Hegel, my new book is going to be coming out today. So that's the final plug for that and once that's out i'm just gonna sleep for three days <laughs> i was gonna say sleep is not the vanishing mediator in this in this uh, project one of the worst things about being sleep deprived and being on camera is that i always get people sending me messages saying are you okay you look so terrible it's like the internet collectively decides to become my mother <laughs> and to say something like you really look like you need more sleep i'm just like yes thank you very much for diagnosing the obvious here um, it would be even worse if people are like oh you look so well rested yeah and then when you do sleep well you get the opposite 
I suppose. <laughs> I suppose. It's a sensitive subject. But I, the thing about sleep is that if you don't sleep, you end up in a situation of diminishing returns. And so I think that everybody here will have understood that there are certain situations in which you have to push, in which you sacrifice sleep in order to do something important, whether it's working on a project, finishing a book, whether it's, I don't know, finishing a video game or a movie. <laughs> And then there's moments in which you really just have to catch up. So, uh, that being said, the show goes on. The show must continue. And today we're going to be launching a new lecture series. So, in a weird way, today is the day that is perfect for you to join. If you're joining us for the very first time, this is a great starting point. Because starting today, we're going to be doing a 12-week new lecture series. And we're going to continue the argument. We're going to make the transition from Hegel to Marx. In other words, we're going to make a transition from talking about speculative idealism towards the idea of what will eventually become dialectical materialism or the philosophy of Marxism. And of course, it's going to still be an introduction to Zizek. So we're going to see how Zizek conceptualizes that transition from Hegel to Marx. And so if you look at it, the three books, essentially, I mean, so far there's two, but there will be a third. The three books are part of one argument, which is that in the first book, we set up a lot of ideas about the relationship between Marx, Hegel, Lacan, and Zizek. In The Vanishing Mediator, we had the idea of a transcendental turn from Kant to Hegel. And in this new series, we're going to focus on the turn from Hegel to Marx. Because one of the things that I've always argued, and not only me, but I think most people who have studied Marx, is that the best way to understand Marx and the best way to begin understanding Marx is precisely by means of going through Hegel. Now, of course, that can often seem frustrating because Hegel is known as a notoriously difficult thinker. And so if you're interested in getting into Marx and then somebody tells you, well, you should start with Hegel, it seems a little bit like somebody saying, if you want to have your steak, you have to eat your vegetables first, right? <laughs> and so what we're going to do in this class is we're going to, we're going to eat the vegetables. We're going to enjoy the process of sort of understanding the way in which Hegel relates to Marx, and in so doing, learn a lot about Zizek and Zizek's very unique take on Lacanian psychoanalysis. That's, that's the project today. <laughs> so if you'd like to join us, this is going to be a 45, 50 minute session. And then every Monday, we're going to be repeating this for the next three months. And I have a title for this series, which is always exciting, choosing a title. <laughs> and the title for the series is going to be Where Nothing is Lacking, Where Nothing is Lacking. So the first series was called The Hermeneutic Temptation. The second series was called The Vanishing Mediator. And this new series is called Where Nothing is Lacking. Now, I can very quickly summarize for you, for those of you who have joined our class before, what those titles mean. The Hermeneutic Temptation, what was that? Well, The Hermeneutic Temptation, unless you've read the book, is simply the temptation to think that essence lies behind appearance. In other words, this is a slightly mocking description of a classic traditional metaphysical structure in which we have a distinct binary separation between essence on the one hand, between the ideal form, truth, purity, the absolute, versus on the other hand, the world of appearances, the material reality, the world of phenomenology, the world of illusion, the world of, in a sense, the cave, right? And this classic metaphysical division between the world of essence and the world of, of appearance was traditionally framed in a prescriptive manner. In other words, the objective was to exit the world of appearance in order to enter into the realm of the ideal. This is the beginning of the idea of Platonic Socratic idealism, the idea that you should be able to exit the cave and find the true ideal form. Now, in my first book, The Hermeneutic Temptation, and I'm sorry if I keep referring to my books in this way, I know it's very pretentious, but I'm just hoping to give you a little bit of a guiding point here. In the first book, the argument that I was trying to make was that this temptation to infer essence behind appearance is itself misleading. And that what happens with Kant and every philosopher after Kant is that there's a necessity, a need to resist the hermeneutic temptation. Now, a hermeneutic is simply a system of thought by which we interpret meaning. A hermeneutic approach is how we make meaning of things. And so the hermeneutic temptation is the temptation to infer that true meaning lies behind the curtain, the veil of appearance. That was the argument of the first book. Sorry for those of you who have already read it. The second book, which is coming out today, The Vanishing Mediator, is essentially a reference to two things. Slavoj Žižek, 
uses the term the vanishing mediator, which he takes from Frederick Jameson. And Slavoj Žižek says that Kant is the vanishing mediator of philosophy. Now, why does Slavoj Žižek say that Kant is the vanishing mediator of philosophy? Well, he says that in the so-called Kantian transcendental turn, in other words, in the Kantian insight that subjective reason is itself the barrier between essence and appearance, we have a revolution within the unfolding of Western philosophical thought. And so that when you're confronted with the Kantian turn, which is this deep pessimism about the potential of human reason, in other words, the idea that we will never reach behind the veil of appearance into essence because our own reason, our own cognitive thought process is itself the barrier, that within that revolution, we have a choice to make. There's either the choice, which is what Hegel does, which is to make the more radical inference that perhaps there is no essence behind appearance, that essence only appears within appearance itself. In fact, that the ultimate illusion is the idea that there is such a thing as essence behind the veil of appearance. Or you can remain within the pre-Kantian transcendental idealist universe and say that there is a strict division. And so the Kantian insight about subjectivity and the centering of the subjective thought process within the mediation, or if you will, the dialectic of essence and appearance is a key vanishing mediator within the entire trajectory of the history of philosophy. In other words, without Kant, Hegel wouldn't have been possible. And so Hegel isn't refuting Kant in the same way that Marx isn't refuting Hegel. Instead, Hegel is pointing out the internal limit within Kantian transcendental idealism, an internal limit from which grows something new, which is, as, which is still that which was already within Kant, which is what Kant could not see, and that's called speculative idealism. Now, something analogous to this happens with Marx, apropos Hegel. Marx isn't refuting Hegel. Marx isn't contradicting Hegel. Marx is, in a sense, finding the internal limit within speculative idealism itself, an internal limit at which Marx, deem, Marx deems capital. Keep in mind that for Hegel, the entire worldview on capital which for Hegel is still very much the world of artisanal craft and master-slave bondage relationship, has to be further expanded within Marx. And so that's what we're going to be doing in this new series. We're going to look at the way in which Marx relates to Hegel, how Marx finds the internal limit within Hegel Hegelian speculative idealism in the same way that Hegel found the internal limit within Kantian transcendental idealism. And so we're going to simply forward that trajectory. We're going to go through that, that progression of the history of philosophy, which is less a progression and more a continuous doubling back in order to go forward. There's a beautiful expression in the German novelist Gunter Grass's novel called Im Krebsgang. And Krebsgang is the German word for how crabs move, which is that crabs can't actually move forward. Crabs move sideways. Mm -hmm. And so if a crab wants to make a forward movement, the crab has to find a horizontal sideway movement of getting there. And that's essentially the same movement that we see within the progress of history and philosophy itself. It's not so much a forward progression by which we take the best of that which has been thought and done, and we incorporate that into the next. It's also not a forward expression of refu refutation. Ref refutation. It's not that we're saying, here's what was wrong and here's how we're going to change it. Instead, the entire history of philosophy emerges by means of a series of breaks from within the insight as to the internal limit of that which came before. In other words, we have im Krebsgang. We have a kind of crab walk of philosophy in which we move like this. And so it's really important to say that Hegelian speculative idealism isn't a refutation of transcendental idealism. Instead, it takes the internal limit of transcendental idealism, which is the subject, and it expands it into a new horizon. The same is true for dialectical materialism and for Marxism. It's not a refutation of speculative idealism. Instead, it takes the properly speculative internal limit of Hegelian idealism and finds the subjective core in it. In other words, the relationship of man, of subject, I should say woman also, but mankind, right? This is where I'm being sexist, in relationship to the commodity. And so we see a transition that happens there. So that's what this new series is gonna be. This new series is going to be called Where Nothing is Lacking. And where nothing is lacking is, I mean, we'll talk more about this, but it's also, all of my titles are sort of like a little bit like jokes. Mm -hmm. And I mean, jokes that only I think are funny, but like where nothing is lacking is my way of referring to the Marxist idea of utopia. 
because the Marxist idea of utopia in the most technical sense of the world word, and don't worry, we'll have 12 weeks to unravel this. The Marxist idea of a utopia is simply a universal that doesn't succumb to its own particular excess. Okay, what does that mean? That seems totally abstract. Mm -hmm. Indeed it is. But basically one of the ideas that Marx has, which Zizek has related to the idea of Freudian Lacanian symptom, is that every universal has a particular excessive feature and that the particular excessive feature becomes disavowed within the universal consciousness and that undermines the universal from within. Now, I'll give you an example of this. Think about freedom, the idea, the universal predicate of freedom. I guess freedom isn't a predicate, but you know what I mean, in order to be. We can think of many different ways in which the universal of freedom becomes particularized. You could say there's the freedom of speech, there's the freedom of assembly, there's the freedom of uh, many ways in which we have freedom. And yet within capitalism, we also have one particular form of freedom that seems to undermine the universal freedom from within. What is that freedom? That's the freedom to sell your own labor. In other words, the freedom to sell your own freedom. To commoditize, to commodify your own freedom on behalf of the freedom to do so. This is also why many people who exploit themselves, who essentially become, I don't know, uh, people who, who in many ways end up working in a dehumanized, alienated way in which they're having to partition their time and their life on behalf of, you know, the surplus profit of somebody else, still consider themselves to be the most free. And that's one of the painful, pro painful paradoxes of capitalism and of human consciousness within capitalism is that we experience this, our, ourself as free at the exact moment that we are freely selling our labor and our time and our precious experience of being here on earth as something that has value as a commodity. And so this is one example in which we have the universal predicate of the idea of freedom that finds its own internal limit within a particular that seems to contradict its very essence. In other words, the freedom to sell your own freedom. And under capitalism, this freedom is presented as the ultimate freedom. The ultimate marker of your freedom isn't your freedom to create or to express yourself or the freedom to do things and go places. Instead, your ultimate freedom is the freedom to construct a version of yourself that can be properly and efficiently commodified so that you can then make money off of it. And if you do that, you are considered a truly free subject, a liberated, emancipated subject. And so the, you see this everywhere. You interview successful people, rich people, and we think, how do they live? What are the habits of the wealthy? What is it that makes them so free? And so this is the paradox, one of the many paradoxes implicit within the capitalist system, which you have to understand Marx is, is, is developing in tandem with the Hegelian idea. The Hegelian idea was already that every universal contains its own particular and that the universal is mediated through this particular subject, consciousness. In other words, the Hegelian insight of speculative idealism, which you'll be able to read about in a proper introduction in my book, is the idea that instead of a strict separation between essence, between the universal and appearance, between the particular, between the infinite and the finite, instead of a strict separation, essence is only created retroactively through the fall into appearance itself. This is essentially what Marx is saying on propos freedom. Mm. If universal substance of freedom, if freedom as a universal finds its ultimate expression in capitalism precisely within the particular that is disavowed as its seeming opposite, i.e. the freedom to sell your own freedom, then we have here a continuation of the Hegelian speculative logic within the commodity, within the process by which the human being renders themselves a commodity. And so one of the fascinating thing that, things that happens here is that Marx is continuing what Kant and Hegel are doing, which is Kant introduces the idea that the subject, the transcendental thinking subject, the subject of reason, is the barrier towards essence. <laughs> Hegel then simply says, no, it's not the barrier, it is the very condition of essence itself. In other words, the subject is the subject of self-relating negativity. The subject is that which posits its own presuppositions through which the absolute is made manifest. Very technical, but we did 12 <laughs> weeks of this in the previous series, all of which are saved for free on IGTV. So if you want to, I don't mean to be like disrespectful, but if you want to brush up, you can watch those. Because I know that like I'm, I'm taking a lot of stuff for granted. We're going very fast. This is the first lecture. And so what happens there is, again, we have a transition from the subject, the individual, the, the cogito of the Kantian transcendental idealist, which, remember, was itself a response to the Descartian, the Cartesian cogito, the supposedly self-transparent subject, which Kant says is not possible, 
From there, we have the Kantian subject that becomes the Hegelian subject, the Hegelian subject that posits its own presuppositions, the Hegelian subject of self-relating negativity. From that subject, we go towards the subject in Marx, which, and this may actually surprise you, is in fact the commodity. One of the things that Marx does, which is really quite radical, and I think often underappreciated, is that Marx thinks about the commodity as subject. And that the subject is structured like a commodity and vice versa, the commodity is structured like a subject. This is actually something that people often gloss over, even when they quote the famous idea that the commodity fetish implies that we treat people as if they were things and things as if they were people. Or that we treat the relation between things as if they were relations between people. And this is the key word, right? It's not that we simply treat objects as if they were people and vice versa. It's not that we dehumanize people as if they were objects working in a factory. It's not that we then treat objects as if they were cherished possessions, like we can talk to them, like we, we treat our phone like a person. There's a part of that, but that's not fully the insight that Marx has. Instead, it's an, it's an argument about mediation and negation. In other words, an argument about relation. It's the argument in which, according to Marx, subjectivity is structured through the commodity relation. Mm. And so we have here a continuation from Kant to Hegel to Marx, which is continuously the question as to what are the conditions of possibility on which, quote unquote, pure subjective reason emerges. You go back to Kant, the critique of pure reason. This is the central problem Kant does, has. He throws down the gauntlet. Kant says, okay, Descartes, if you can think, therefore you are, then obviously there's already a problem here, which means that you have yourself as your own concept. You have turned yourself into an object of your thought, which you've confused, confused with your own essence. From the Cartesian turn, we go towards the Kantian turn, where Kant essentially says that the subject is precisely that which tries to think of its own essence and fails. In other words, we have the idea of the antinomies, the idea of the internal barriers within thought itself, that which can only be conceptualized but not materialized, for example, God and the soul. And through that process, we have the Hegelian creation of the subject, which Zizek has argued is the idea of a split subject, a subject that emerges within the split between essence and appearance itself. The subject that is a symptomatic excessive feature, in Lacanian terms, that emerges precisely within this disavowed universal. And Marx simply continues this argument by saying that the way in which that happens in the world, the way in which this subject, the subject of supposedly pure reason emerges is precisely through the exchange of goods in the form of commodities. And so we have for Marx essentially a theory of the subject, which is mediated through the entire philosophical progression of the Cartesian turn, the Kantian turn, the Hegelian turn, and then finally the Marxist turn. I'm gonna take a quick breath here to say that what we're doing in this first lecture is to give you a little bit of a, of a map of what we're gonna do for the next three months. So if you, at this point, and I don't mean to be pedantic here, but if at this point this seems like a lot, like quite a lot, especially if you're just a beginner, that's okay. We're essentially giving you all the ingredients and over the next three months, we will extrapolate from these ingredients so that every week we take things apart. But what I'm not doing is I'm not trying to simplify it too much here. So I'm giving you the blueprint, but for the next three months, we'll be able to expand. I hope you see that as a sign of respect and courtesy towards you. Because I think one of the worst things is when somebody, when a lecturer does a, a first mm -hmm. class as mm -hmm. a taster session, and it's like super fun, and you sign up for that class, and then for the next like three months for the next semester, like it's actually really dry. Yeah, so, they put all the best material yeah, in the yeah, first yeah. week. <laughs> so I want to briefly make a pivot towards Zizek here because this is also an introduction to how Zizek conceives of this, this link from Kant to Hegel to Marx. Mm -hmm. Zizek's most famous book is, is our, I mean, sort of undisputedly the sublime object of ideology. It's kind of funny to me because the sublime object of ideology was sort of like a sensation, but it wasn't necessarily like a big hit amongst academics, like a publishing sensation. It was actually something that spread very much amongst graduate students. It was very much like a viral sensation before the internet. It was that, and, and Zizeka says that this made him very happy, that the sublime object of ideology didn't become quote unquote important because the experts in academia decided it was important, 
It became important because it resonated with graduate students who started passing the text amongst themselves, who started organizing discussions and conferences. And so I really genuinely believe that often where the most important next generation of ideas comes from is when you have that resonance with with people who get you, when you have that kind of an international community. Of course, this is sort of what we're trying to recreate here. I mean, you will understand that. Mm-hmm. It's a self-serving argument, ultimately. And so the sublime object of ideology, um, the question here is, what is the sublime object? Like, what does Zizek actually mean by the sublime object? And it's kind of interesting because his first two major books, I mean, he, he'd written books before that, but the two, like, well-known books are The Sublime Object of Ideology and The Ticklish Subject. And Zizek has often said that The Ticklish Subject is the more serious book. In fact, that it's ironic to him that it was The Sublime Object of Ideology that became so well-known because The Ticklish Subject is really where he was making his big argument. Now, of course, The Ticklish Subject is also a bit of a joke. It's a bit of a pun. On the one hand, the subject is tickled by what? By the object. This is basically the Lacanian idea of the objet petit a. The objet petit a is not what you want. It is not the object of desire. It is the object cause of desire. And so within the famous Lacanian triad between the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real, the imaginary being how you encounter yourself within the mirror stage, the image that you have of your own head, the symbolic being the symbol of you as you are represented to others, as a father, as a teacher, as a son, and so on. And then the real being the indiv- like the indivisible remainder between those two, which is the fact that there is no authentic subjectivity, that the ultimate illusion is the idea of authentic subjectivity itself, that you are your own mask. There's no true you behind the mask of mediation by means of image and symbol. It is that you emerge through the crack between the image and the symbol itself. And so that's what Lacan would refer to as the ticklish subject. I mean, he doesn't literally, but that's his idea of the ticklish subject. The subject doesn't exist to begin with. The subject is provoked into a kind of hysterical giggling by means of the object cause of desire, which is the objet petit a. It's not that what you want, it's that what makes you continue wanting. And for Zizek, this subject, this the ticklish subject, is also a provocative philosophical political argument as to the role of the subject within the teaching of philosophy as it was in the 80s and 90s. Now, what does that mean? According to the postmodernists, the post-structuralists, the, I mean, even some of the structuralists, the subject was inherently suspicious. The idea of identity, the idea of having a subject that you could cultivate, a personality that in a Foucauldian sense, you could protect from the, you know, the uh, corrupting influences of biopolitics, that the subject had become totally suspicious. In fact, the very idea that people would write about the subject within left-wing critical theory, philosophical discourse, was, had become a kind of taboo. Because no one believed that subjectivity existed on that kind of essential level. Instead, the subject was that which was formed by structural, institutional forces. And the irony is that Zizek says that he advocates a return to the theory of the subject, In other words, he even says this at the beginning of the ticklish subject. He says, a rehabilitation of the Cartesian cogito, which that is a total provocation. You have to understand that when he writes that on like page one, it's basically like a huge insult to everybody whose entire philosophical edifice structures about being anti-Cartesian. In fact, Zizek is posing as being an enlightenment conservative for a moment. Mm -hmm who believes that reason is the Aristotelian tool by which we can know the essence of the world, etc. But of course, no such thing is true, because immediately after Zizek says that he wants to rehabilitate the Cartesian cogito, the self-transparent subject, Zizek says, but it will be the self-transparent subject of the Lacanian edifice through Hegel. In other words, to emphasize the role of the creation of the subject from Kant to Hegel to Marx through the Lacanian concept of the barred subject. In other words, the subject that doesn't exist except through the fall into its own non-identity, the idea of the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real. And so Zizek is being very cheeky. This is why the ticklish subject is in many ways like his most important, most radical work. And after that, he just extrapolates from that. 
which is to say, yes, let's return to the idea of the self-transparent subject, the Cartesian cogito, but let's do it with a twist. Let's do it through the Lacanian bard subject, and in so doing, let's show how the entire edifice of Hegelian speculative idealism, rather than being the stereotypical closed system of absolute idealism in which everything happens for a reason and the subject is simply the puppet of instrumental reason or what Hegel calls the cunning of reason, instead of all of that, let us find an open Hegel, a radically open emancipatory Hegel in which the subject is the very site of a kind of excessive eruption of being through which we can understand the emancipation of the subject in Marx. In other words, let's properly understand dialectical materialism through a return to the theory of subjectivity in this very manner. That's Zizek's argument in the Tickler subject, which is like a pretty radical thing. From that, you can make the necessary step back to the sublime object of ideology. And so many people will say, where do I start with Zizek? They're usually told, start with the sublime object of ideology, which is not a bad idea because it's an easier book to read and it's more enjoyable to read. But if you really want to understand the implications of the argument, you start with the tickler subject and then you revert back to the sublime object of ideology. Now, what again is the sublime object of ideology? Well, for Zizek, the sublime object is money. Money for Zizek is the sublime object because money is not that which only exists in material form, nor is it that which exists in an abstract form. Money is that which persists to have material consequences beyond its own material being. In other words, the very way in which we experience material reality, the way in which we experience ourselves as sub subjects in the world, is structured through the commodity fetish. And so we structure the subject as if the subject were a commodity which is not unlike Lacan's idea that the subject is structured like a fiction, that we only access reality by means of fantasy. In other words, that there is no distinct separate separation between, between reality and fantasy, which is, of course, Lacan's take on the metaphysical argument about the strict separation between essence and appearance. And so one of the things that Lacan has always argued is that you have to take this philosophical discourse and incorporate that within psychoanalytic practice. And when Lacan says that the only way we can access reality is through fantasy, he's saying that counter to the traditional clinical idea of psychology, where in order to be more realistic, you have to shed your hysterical attachment to everything that is not real, everything that is just in your mind, everything that is fantasy, for Lacan, it's exactly the opposite. For Lacan, he says that the only way that you access reality is through fantasy. That there is no strict separation between the virtual of fantasy, like virtual reality, and reality. It's that the only way you experience reality is by means of a kind of virtual processing of it. On a very elemental level, you could imagine that when, as, when you're a child, you play, I don't know, for example, you play cops and robbers. <laughs> You pretend that you're a character in a movie. You access your engagement with the world saying, I am Luke Skywalker, or I'm jumping off the couch and I pretend I'm skydiving. Here we have a very literal way in which you inhabit the world through symbolic fictions that you found on the cinema. It's also why, as I said in the previous lecture series, Zizek says that cinema is the perverted art. Not because it's bad, but because cinema, the narrative and the language of cinema, allows you to more fully inhabit your own life. When I'm kissing or making love or fighting or crossing the street, I'm doing it as if I were the person in the movie. <laughs> and this whole idea that we see, for example, on TikTok, that you are the main character, mm -hmm. is itself a reflection of this Lacanian, Zizekian argument, that you don't access reality directly, you access reality through fantasy. You access reality through thinking of yourself as a character accessing reality. And so this is the narrative fiction that structures subjectivity itself. This is also why Lacan essentially says that reality is structured like a fiction. And that's what Zizek simply links to Marx. Marx says that if reality is structured like a fiction, then the fiction that structures reality is the fiction of the commodity fetish. In other words, the way in which the relation between things becomes structured as the relation between people, but more importantly, vice versa, the way in which the relation between things structures the relation of the subject itself from within. 
And so here we're back at a theory of the subject, the theory of the subject that Zizek traces from Kant to Hegel to Marx. Mm -hmm. A couple more things. Is this okay so far? <laughs> yeah. I'm enjoying this, but like I feel like it's like a lot. It's so. laying out a lot of pieces. No, and it's all it's all really. Um, I'm with you. Yeah. It's like I know that some people take notes, and I know that sounds pretentious, but like what I want to say is like if you take notes and you enjoy taking notes, you will hopefully see that that I'm not just spouting nonsense as much as I'm trying to make it look like I'm spouting nonsense. <laughs> um, hopefully, that's also why having these classes in book form helps mm -hmm. because. Very briefly to say, when, when, I, when I release the books that accompany the lectures, like The Hermeneutic Temptation, which, plug, is the last day you can get it today, or The Vanishing Mediator, which comes out today, I want it to be useful. I think the only reason why you would ever release a book is for it to be useful to people. Like, the idea that I would release a book as a status object or as a vehicle of promotion within an academic career structure, the idea that you would put together a book just to entertain people... Mm -hmm. I find that self-indulgent. And so the reason when I put out a book is it's simply because I want to provide you, hopefully, the most succinct, the slowest, most digestible version of what we're otherwise essentially improvising in a three-month session. Mm -hmm. Because I know that not everybody has the time to do this whole project with us. I respect that. It's, it's a luxury that we get to do this. And so that's why I do the book, is it's my way of saying I want to provide something hopefully very useful to you. Okay, back to Marx. One of the arguments that Zizek makes in The Sublime Object of Ideology, he makes this in chapter one, is that there's an analogous situation that happens between the Marxist hermeneutic and the Freudian hermeneutic. And a quick reminder, the Freudian hermeneutic, in other words, the way in which meaning is interpreted within the Freudian structure, is the Lacanian structure. Lacan and Freud are two sides of the same coin. Lacan simply takes Freudian principles, finds their internal limit, and radicalizes them. It's a continuation of Freud. I mean, literally for Lacan, it was the school of the cause of Freud, and then the cause of the school of Freud, etc. Um, and so, if you're studying Lacan, you have to understand that you are studying many Freudian ideas that are, that are through the lens of Lacan. But Jizek says that, essentially, the Marxist hermeneutic approach, the hermeneutic method, is analogous to that of the Freudian hermeneutic method. In a method, in other words, the way in which meaning is interpreted. And it, it works in two stages. This is something that you can, you can see quite clearly. Freud says, the beginning of my hermeneutic is that we take dreams seriously. In other words, that we're interested in the content of the dream. I want to know what you dream. I want you to describe to me what you're dreaming. This is dream analysis. The second step seems to be the exact opposite. The second step is to say, I'm interested in the meaning of your dream, but I'm not interested in what it means. And so what's the difference here? How can you say that you're interested in the meaning of the dream, but not what it means? Well, you're essentially saying you're interested in the structure of the dream, but not what it symbolizes. Here you see a big division between Freud and Jung. Freud is working, uh, sorry, Jung is working on the level of the archetype, on the level of the symbol as image. The symbol represents something. Freud says that what you dream of doesn't actually matter very much. If you dream of unicorns, it doesn't, it doesn't represent an impossible desire for something which you can't have. It's not a direct representation of an unconscious desire. Instead for Freud, it's a direct representation of an unconscious repression. In other words, something you desire but you cannot give form to. And so here we have a very big difference between the idea that what you dream means something which it represents. I dream of money and I want money. I want to be wealthy. Or the idea that what you're dreaming represents that which you cannot put into thought. And so in a technical sense, we've gone from simply identifying the content of the dream, the meaning of the dream, towards what is the underlying form of the content itself. In other words, what is the underlying, quote-unquote, repressed, unconscious structure that determines the sequence of meaning in the dream itself? Which is, again, a metaphysical argument. Mm -hmm. This is what Lacan teases out of it. Which is to say that 
if we have the classic metaphysical division between essence and appearance, in which essence is simply the barrier towards the true content that lies behind it, you see that in the classic metaphysical division between essence and appearance, we have a strict separation between form and content. Form being the world of appearances, and content being the ideal truth behind the world of appearances. And now you can see that like in a Jungian sense, this is the classic metaphysical divide, which is that we have something, the symbol of something and what it represents, the meaning within, the meaning behind the symbol. Whereas within the Freudian dream analysis, we have a total disruption of the metaphysical divide, which is to say, it's not that the dream is the illusion behind which you have the reality. Instead, the structure of the dream, the way in which the dream presents itself as a form to you, contains itself a secret as to the structure of how it came into being. In other words, the conditions of possibility, which is another way of saying that the dream isn't hiding a secret. The secret is the structure of the dream itself. In other words, we've gone from a strict separation between form and content, between the form of the representation of the dream towards its supposedly hidden content or meaning towards the hidden, quote unquote, repressed content in the form itself. The content in the form itself being the way in which the dream is structured through the unconscious repression. This is analogous, claims Zizek, to what Marx does. Marx says, or let's say Zizek says that this is how Marx is like Freud. Marx says that the same process applies to the commodity. The Marxist hermeneutic, the method of making meaning, of interpreting meaning, starts by saying, let's take the commodity seriously. Let's analyze the commodity. In a similar way that Freud says, let's analyze the dream. Except, like Freud, Marx says there is no innate value or meaning to the commodity itself. The commodity is not a direct representation of a hidden value. It's not that there is a true value underlying it. Instead, what Marx wants to do, step two, is to look to the way in which the representation of value is itself unconsciously structured. In other words, Marx is not looking towards what is the content, the true value of the commodity behind the appearance of the commodity. Instead, Marx is saying, what is the content within the form itself? In other words, how does the very mediation, the structural relationship between the exchange of goods retroactively create the illusion of an ideal value that the commodity is supposed to obstruct? And so again, we have here a continuation of the metaphysical critique. Traditionally, within Kantian metaphysics, we have the idea of essence and appearance being separated. Sorry to keep repeating this, but I want to be like method <laughs> methodical here. And Marx says it's not that we have a supposedly true underlying a priori value that exists within the good and that the commodity fetish is the misrepresentation of that true originating value. Instead, the value is precisely that which only emerges through the exchange of goods. Now, let me give you a couple of examples to make this a little bit easier. I mean, this has been a very hard, like abstract, but basically one of the things that Zizek says is that if you look at the relationship in which money was studied and conceptualized before Marx, it basically falls into three categories. You have the sort of very traditional classical mercantilist approach to money in which money is like a magical substance in which money is like the portal that opens the door of modernity and that money enables like the, the progress of humankind itself. That if we didn't have money, we would be relegated to the realm of the barter economy. This is sort of like the ideology of the mercantilist spirit. Secondly, we have the idea of the bourgeois economy, which actually you will find resonances of today, which is that money is simply the renumeration for work well done. In other words, that we can identify the value of something as it exists, and we can say this is worth X amount of money. And so that a certain amount of time, a certain amount of labor, a certain amount of quality should be remunerated by a, a corresponding value. And that you pay more for something that has better quality. 
This is, of course, part of the bourgeois ideology that you will still see today, which is you pay more, you pay a premium for the idea of something being artisanal, handcrafted, etc. <clears throat> now, the third approach, after the mercantilist and the bourgeois approach, is the neoclassical approach. The neoclassical approach being the approach in which you say there is no originating value. Instead, value is regulated by the market itself, by the exchange of goods, by the ebb and flow of demand. And I mean, Jenlene knows more about this because Jenlene is actually <laughs> versed in political economy. And so we have the that, that value originates through this structuring back and forth of demand and right? supply. Supply. Thank you. Demand. I was going to say demand and need, but it's demand and supply. <laughs> demand and supply. So we have here essentially three approaches, right? We have the approach of the mercantilist who sees money as like this magical substance, the spark of life. We have the bourgeois ideology, which identifies a true content within the labor value that has to be properly remunerated, which is a fetish that you see continue today. For example, when you buy fair trade coffee, it literally says on the package, we're paying the farmers what they're due. That way of framing the exchange mm -hmm. of value is bourgeois in that very sense. And the neoclassical approach, which becomes predominant within neoliberalism today and within the idea of sort of even like the global exchange of goods and capitalism and the world is flat and all that stuff, is is precisely this idea that there is, is again, almost like merc merc mercantilist spirit, a sublime, within the self-regulating structure of the exchange of goods themselves. You were going to say something? No, huh? I'm with you. I know that like, I'm just like yeah. monologuing here, but <laughs> no, it's like so much to No, there's a lot to, to say about it, but I'm glad we're doing uh, 12 weeks on Marx, because I'm sure there'll be plenty more to say about it. So what does Marx do? Mm -hmm. Well, Marx essentially goes beyond this, this structure, mm -hmm. of these three ways of approaching it. And Marx says, there's no original value to the commodity. In fact, the point isn't to say that we should pay workers according to what they're actually worth or what their labor is actually worth. The, the point of exploitation isn't to say that people are exploited because they're not being properly remunerated. The Marxist argument is to say that everybody needs a pay raise. That's not the argument. The argument that Marx says is that, and this is again actually very Hegelian, again, it's the internal limit within Hegelian speculative idealism in which the universal structures the subject from within. Marx says the universal isn't out there. The universal of quote-unquote false consciousness comes into being through the very exchange of commodities, through the positing of such a thing as an a priori value. And, and the basic idea is this, which is that if you have two things that are being exchanged, the manner in which they're exchanged creates the value. And so what essentially happens is that there's a kind of self-relating negativity within the exchange of commodities themselves, an identity that is formed precisely through the non-identity of the thing with itself. In other words, as soon as you exchange something, you've created an abstraction. And Marx says there is no hidden content, no true value underneath the commodity that can be exposed. And so we can have a perfect system in which everything gets exactly what it's worth. Instead, the very idea of value comes through this non-identity of the object with itself, the refraction of the object through mediation with other objects, which is necessitated by its refraction through the non-mediation of the subject with itself. In other words, the subject becomes mirrored to other subjects, mediated to other subjects. You are refracted to others by means of the way in which you identify value of objects being refracted amongst themselves. And so we're back at the Marxist definition of the commodity fetish, which is not that we treat objects like people and people like objects, but that the relation between objects becomes structured like the relations between people and vice versa. And so we're actually back at a philosophical argument, specifically a very Hegelian argument about the conditions of possibility for the idea of quote unquote pure reason itself. And so I just like, I have so many examples of this that I want to share that we want to do in the lectures. <laughs> like we just don't have time for like, I saw a video the other day, which was, I don't know if it was a spoof or not. Mm. This is the, this is the age of the internet we're in now where I can't tell <laughs> reality from fiction. It's like reading the onion, which mm -hmm. is a satirical newspaper. And it was an article about a company. I think it must have been a spoof. But I don't know. Maybe it wasn't a spoof. <laughs> I really can't tell. In which uh, they decided that as sneakers have become a desirable commodity. Mm -hmm. But of course, also a tradable commodity, right? The whole point of sneakers is that now the value fluctuates depending on how much they're in demand or how trendy they are because there's a limited quantity of them. And so sneakers become almost like a kind of wearable NFT or something, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the dilemma is this. As soon as you wear a sneaker, it seems to diminish in value. 
it's the same with comic books. If you open the comic mm -hmm. book, it diminishes in value. I recently saw like a meta comic book, which was, or meta, like a, one of those 1980s like figurine toys that mm. are collectible that you can't open from the box. And this was a box of the box. <laughs> like it was like a, it was great. It was a very funny joke. And, and so the point here is to say, how do you properly represent the value of the sneaker in its very fluctuation? In other words, if the value of the sneaker is constantly fluctuating, one day it's high, the other day it's low, how do you represent how expensive your sneakers are? In other words, sneakers are no longer a representation of the wealth that it symbolizes, your wealth to buy that sneaker. The sneaker becomes a direct representation of the fluctuating wealth within itself. Now, the company said, we are going to make a digital price tag, which you can connect to your shoe while you're wearing it, and this will be constantly updated on the internet so that there is a digital screen, a price tag on your shoe that constantly will show other people what the true value of the sneaker is in the moment. I want this to be true. I, think I want this is, to yeah. be a true story. It's a great startup <laughs> idea. And they have a video of them like yeah. testing it out. And so like you're wearing like your whatever Yeezy sneakers mm -hmm. and depending on what day it is, the price tag will show a different price. Now here... The, the sort of vulgar Marxist approach would be to say, this is corrupting human consciousness, and if only we could shed our our illusion of price and value, we could go back to being our we real self. We could realize that a shoe is just a shoe. A shoe is yeah. just a shoe, and it's just something you walk on, and this whole thing is like a fetish, and if only we could just go back to simple living, then the world would be a better place. What Marx says is that that is itself the fetish. The fetish is the idea that you could go back to common living without this kind of mediation. Of course, that's the very idea of like the Birkenstock. Mm -hmm. I love Birkenstocks, I wear them like all year round. But Birkenstocks are sold to you specifically as this is the shoe that resists being a commodity fetish item. This is the shoe that isn't a style object. This is the shoe that is so ugly that it becomes aesthetic. This is the shoe that's comfortable, but that looks terrible. <laughs> and of course, that whole narrative of here is the non-ideological shoe, is the ideology of Birkenstock. And this is precisely what Marx is pointing out. I mean, Marx doesn't wear Birkenstock, <laughs> but what Marx is pointing out is that this refraction of mediation continues. The very narrative of the Birkenstock as being the natural shoe is itself mediated by the supposedly non-natural substance of the sneaker. And you, they can't be detached. And so what and he's not saying this is bad in a normative sense. He's simply saying that the way in which we structure the relation between things comes to be the way in which we structure the relation between people. And now you can understand why Zizek calls his first book the sublime object of ideology. Because ideology is the way in which we retroactively try to infer meaning into that gap that is created between the structure between things, which we now experience as the structure between people. In other words, the quote unquote ideology of Birkenstock is precisely that it's telling you, you are now a ethical consumer. You are now somebody who isn't somebody who succumbs to the commodity fetish. You are a better person, etc. And so that is ideology. Ideology is the process by within the mediation of appearances within the commodity fetish, you are told that you are somehow exempt from it. And so ideology <laughs> structures the way in which we perceive our lived reality within the pre-mediated substance of the subject experienced as commodity. That's Marx's most important insight, and that's why Zizek calls his book the sublime object, the commodity of ideology. But that's also, I mean, I not, yelling, to make it, no, <laughs> not to make it too obvious, but that's exactly why you have to start with the hermeneutic temptation, the notion that you have to resist the urge to ascribe meaning to everything. Because once you think that you're finding the story behind the thing, yeah. that's exactly when you trap yourself. So the question isn't how do you try to escape ideology? It's how do you find these internal limits and contradictions yeah. and make sense within them rather than moving beyond them because it's precisely when you think that you have moved beyond them that you become even more ensnared. Yeah, it's the exact moment at which you're told that you're living in a non-ideological, post-ideological space that you are most within ideology. Mm -hmm. In the same way that when you're telling yourself that by buying ethical sneakers, you're not a sneaker purchaser, you're most within the realm of the commodity. Mm -hmm. um, what Marx is interested in, and this is where we should end, Marx isn't just coming up with a theory of the subject. In other words, Marx isn't doing what Kant did, which is Kant, remember, the critique of pure reason is simply saying, how can there be a subject of pure thought? Which 
Kant doesn't think is possible. That hence the critique of pure reason. Pure reason is an oxymoron. It's a par- it's a contradiction in terms. Mm-hmm. The idea of particular subjective thought being somehow a vehicle of the absolute for Kant is an impossibility. Hence the critique of pure reason, which is continued in the idea of speculative idealism. What's important is that for Hegel, speculative idealism isn't the process by which the subject realizes essence. It's the process by which essence realizes the subject by a fall within subject itself. In other words, as Zizek puts it, by which the gap between essence and appearance becomes imminence, imminent within appearance itself from which emerges essence. And that crack is the crack of subjectivity, the split subject, Lacanian Bart subject. Now, Marx is the quote-unquote first one who wants to emancipate the subject, to liberate the subject. You have to understand the entire point of Marxism is the idea of an emancipated subject, the idea of a subjectivity that could somehow transcend this cage between essence and appearance. And so revolution and utopia for Marx isn't just saying let's have a different form of government. Instead for Marx, utopia is precisely a universal that doesn't succumb to its own particular, its own internal limitation, as I said before. Or, as the lecture title of this series indicates, utopia is where nothing is lacking. Mm -hmm. And where nothing is lacking is the idea of the emancipated subject, a subject that isn't simply symptomatic. Because the idea of symptom, for Freud and Lacan, a symptom is when you have a disavowed particular content within a universal substance that secretly undermines it, that you have to disavow. In other words, the critique of ideology is already symptomatic to capitalism because said critique only occurs within the confines of capitalism. And Marx is essentially saying, and this is something where, again, Zizek links Freud to Marx, that subjectivity is symptomatic. That what you experience as your own identity is a symptom of the commodity fetish. And Marx is looking for what would a subjectivity look like that isn't symptomatic, that isn't alienated, that is properly emancipated. And the site, the place of non-being in which this non-symptomatic subject could thrive is for Marx the place of utopia, the place where nothing is lacking. Okay. (laughs) That's a lot. (laughs) So I know this is like a ton, but like if you've joined my classes before, the first class in every new series is super intense (laughs) because we just throw it all out there. It's like all the ingredients are there. Well, and it seems really technical. I'm not hiding anything from you. (laughs) It's just there. And if you're curious about this, I don't blame you if you're not, but if you're curious about this, We're going to spend three months, the next 12 weeks or 11 weeks, slowly picking this apart so that by the end of it, it will all make perfect sense. And you could literally, I mean, perfect sense is maybe a bit rich, but you could go back to this class and be like, oh yeah, this is not new to me. I could totally, totally explain this to somebody. And so I hope that you understand the quote unquote difficulty and the abstract technical sense of this first class in the series that you don't take that as an insult, but that you take that as a gesture of respect. A gesture that I respect your intelligence, I respect your commitment, and that I think that if you're willing to go through this process with me, you'll be able to see how this is actually totally self-evident. And so in the next 11 weeks, every Monday, 8 a.m. USA PT, from eight to nine, uh, we're gonna be hosting a class. But it's gonna be a little bit more a little bit more enjoyable, a little bit more easy, a little bit more popular. We're gonna use examples that will make sense. <laughs> Jenlene is going to be co-hosting this discussion with me. Usually Jenlene <laughs> and I sort of go back and forth, but in yeah. the first class, I just wanna, we're throwing everything out there. I'm not hiding anything from you. This is, the, this is what we're gonna cover mm-hmm. in the next 12 weeks. And I really hope that you'll be along for the ride. Yeah. So I wanna say a big thank you to all yes. of our patrons for joining us. Yes. To all of our new students, I'd like to say welcome. To everybody who has joined these open access classes for the past year, two years. Two years, almost two years. We're so yeah. grateful. Thank you for allowing us to thrive and grow. Um, we feel so, so, so grateful to be doing all of this stuff. Yeah. So thank you guys. It is a true privilege. And final plug, <laughs> my book, The Hermeneutic Temptation, 
is available for one more day. Today is January 31st. Today is the last day to get it. After that, if you become a patron, you'll only be getting the next one, The Vanishing Mediator, the book based on the previous lecture series. Um, but if you sign up today, you'll actually get both of those books. You'll get the Hermeneutic Temptation plus The Vanishing yes. Mediator. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Um, please take a moment to click the link in our bio. And in five minutes, we're going to host a Q&A on Discord for our patrons. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you are a patron, um, please join us on Discord. Or if you'd like to become a patron and join us for this new series, yeah. of course, you're very much invited. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> and we shall see you next week. Have a great week, everyone. Bye-bye. Oh, someone says, can you repeat the time of the classes? Yes. Same time. 8 a.m. USA PT here on Instagram and on YouTube every week. It's never changed. We've never, never missed changed. a single Monday. We think Monday. it's 4 p.m. UK time. 4 like, p.m. UK time. 4 p.m. in London. So hope that helps. All right. See you guys. And to YouTube, thank you guys very much for deleting the spam. I'm sorry we can't spam, do anything really? about that. Yeah, spam I in the comments. So. Is there good spam or yeah. like boring spam? I think it was just boring spam. It it flashes and then it disappears really uh, quickly. So sometimes it's really hard for us to see the comments. But thank you guys. Take care. See you next week. <laughs>